What's up, y'all? My name's Leticia, and you're listening to Confessions from the Closet, a podcast all about vulnerability and overcoming. It's time we get ourselves unstuck from these boxes and these closets that we've allowed ourselves to be trapped in. We're so much bigger than these boxes we've been in. It's time we go deep, y'all. What's up, you guys? Thank you for joining me once again. Um, I am solo today, and I thought I would talk more about a topic that me and Maddie had covered last week, and I didn't really go as in depth as I wanted to. I had reco- I, like I had talked about in last week's episode. I had recorded it by myself, you know, a week before, and I just wasn't sure that I liked what I recorded. So I thought I would give it another try and go more, you know, like deeper into this topic. Um, So here I am doing that. Uh, At the end of the episode, we talked about perfection and just this lie that we have to be perfect. um, And how that lie can keep us in bondage. You know, whether it be through comparing ourselves on social media to other women or other moms or other entrepreneurs or business owners or um, whatever it is that's your thing. We live in a society where it's so easy to put on a an image of yourself that isn't accurate. You know, here, even just recording this video, you know, I have these big lights and I have a microphones and a really nice camera, which isn't even like the nicest camera. It's just nice for me, um, you know, but it makes this image and this sound look and feel so much better than it actually is. I mean, if I turned it around, you would see that behind me or in front of me, I guess, is a basement full of arts and crafts and a drum kit and boxes and storage and, you know, but this looks really nice. So even, I mean, even this as an example, it's, I'm filming in a basement, but we made it look better than it actually is. And as a mom, I know I see, I see whether it be on TikTok or Instagram, I see other moms who like have all these tips and, you know, how to parent your child. And then you get down on yourself, like so easily, you just get down on, well, I'm not doing this right. Cause I had 20 breakdowns today or whatever, you know, I lost it on my kids so many times. And this, this mom, you know, she has it together. Why can't I parent like that? And that feeds into that spirit of perfection. That's such a lie. And I find myself doing it so often. Like, you know, Apollo, I said in the last episode, he's like full energy. I mean, we went on vacation last week with our worship team and the first night we were there, Apollo fell off the bed in his sleep and started throwing up and then acted normal. So he didn't go to the ER. And then later the next afternoon, he started throwing up like three more times. So I rushed him to the ER, you know, um, those are the stories that are, that are real, but we don't see as much. And, um, that whole time, like even when we decided not to go in the middle of the night to the hospital, like I was questioning myself, like, am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right choice by waiting? And being a mom, I don't know, maybe just being a woman already has such a hard thing on it, you know, without comparing ourselves to other moms. Like we're already hard on ourselves. I know I am. Like I'm already like, man, did I make the right choice? Did I, did I discipline them right? Did I should I have not disciplined them, you know, and all that to say, like, Apollo is full energy. And so parenting him looks totally different than parenting Amaya. So when I watch other moms give advice, you know, and I try it and I'm like, oh, it's not working. Um, then I, then I find myself getting down on myself. Like, like I, I'm an even worse mom than I thought before, because I have this other thing that I'm trying to live up to that wasn't mine to live up to in the first place, you know, or making this podcast, um, you know, I, I had this whole plan when I started this venture, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, I had, you know, things written down, who I was going to film, who was going to record, how it was going to go, what the order was. And then it, it hasn't gone that way. Like 
zero percent of what I had planned has happened. It's been pretty all over the place. And I think in life, the spirit of per- perfection or control or whatever you want to call it, like this, this thing that we're all trying to live up to is just keeping us down and holding us back. And something I've been trying to learn with doing this podcast is like, if it doesn't go the way I plan to like, just roll with it and go with the next thing. Like last week, Maddie was on and that wasn't planned, but I was like, Hey, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna interview you. Like, let's do this. And even tonight, like we, I was going to interview Maddie again and just talk. And I like really didn't have an idea of what we were going to talk about. And so we decided not to do it. And I'm just sitting down here and I was like, you know what, this is a topic I had perfection. I'm going to roll with this and I'm going to do it. And so, um, even just being gay, like, I feel like I have to be perfect in order for people to like me, which I know is a lie. I just have to be me. And if people don't like me, like, that's okay. Move on next. Um, because for so many years hiding being gay, I was, I was broken on the inside, but nobody knew why, you know, I I remember, um, when I was in college, I went through depression for the first time and I worked at a country club where I was a bartender. And so I would, um, I would drink while I was at work, like in the like bar room, I would like have myself my own drink and drink. And I was like 19 years old. And then I would go to football games or go hang out with my friends and eat like Fritos because I had heard that would like cut the alcohol smell and I would go around them, but I was just trying to drink away my pain. And I so desperately wanted to be seen and heard, but I was so scared of what the reaction would be. And I think even, you know, now, as a mom, we, I find myself in these positions where it's like, it's hard to admit, like you don't have it all together. Or you're still struggling because we live in a world where social media shows the best, but not the worst. And we forget that that's not actual reality. And so now even trying to raise a 10 year old who's so desperate to be on social media and so desperate to see if we post something about her, like how many likes did I get? How many comments? And to remind her like that's not where your um, validation or acceptance comes from. Like that has to come from within. And we can't, I mean, even me, I can't base my value on external validation or external acceptance. I have to love and accept myself to find that self-worth. And then when you add in social media and like, oh, I got likes or I got comments and and trying to teach a 10-year-old, like, hey, this isn't real. This isn't real love. This isn't real validation. This isn't a measure of how great or awesome you are. Did you do something that you were proud of? Did you um, did you enjoy making that video? Did you enjoy doing what you did with your friend? Regardless of if you got likes or comments, did, you, did it bring you joy when you did it? Are you proud of yourself? Do you think you could do better? You know, like, that's all that matters. And... Um, you know, trying to teach a 10 year old that, and then trying to also like teach my 33 year old self that is, I mean, it's one and the same. And so, uh, a a question like I wrote down when I was thinking about this is like, who am I trying to be perfect for? Because as far as I'm concerned now, it's like, I was never destined to be or called to be perfect. I was just called to be me. And to live out my truth. And, you know, I stepped away from social media and sharing videos and sharing my thoughts and my ideas for so long because I think somewhere in all of that, I lost who I was. Like, I came out. I knew who I was before I came out, except I was hiding the fact that I was gay. Then I came out. I lost a lot of friends. Then I got into um, online coaching And I was motivated to share a lot of videos and it started to like bring that part of me back that like loves sharing videos and ideas and my thoughts. And, and then I started like morphing into like this person who I didn't recognize anymore. And, um, I just had to step back to like figure out who I was. And I think now stepping back into all of this, I'm starting to learn to trust myself and learn to trust the process that it doesn't have to always go as planned. And, um, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just, if I'm speaking from my heart and I'm speaking about stuff that matters to me, even if it isn't things that matter to everyone that I love and follow, because 
there's a lot of thoughts and ideas of people who I absolutely love on social media that I completely disagree with. But like, I would love to talk to an interview and sit down and just pick apart their brains and their thoughts. But I know we have a lot of things that we totally disagree on. And so the most important thing to me that I'm learning and trying to live out is, am I being true to myself or am I trying to also bend towards, well, I want them to like me. So I'm going to also like throw in something that I disagree with, but then they might like me if I say this, um, going back to also with that idea is I saw a Maya one time she has, she had two little friends down the street. One of them just moved, but, um, one day they were all at the house and I heard the other two girls say they didn't like something and whatever they were talking about, I don't remember what it was, but whatever it was, I knew it was something Amaya loved. And I just, I was like watching her to see how she was going to respond. And in that moment, she just said, yeah, I don't like that either. And I was just like, oh, damn. So later that day, I was like, look, I don't, I'm not raising a follower. I'm raising leaders in this house. We are leaders. And part of that means that we don't say we don't like something because people around us say they don't like it. It's like, I know you loved that thing that they didn't like. And so you said you didn't like it also in hopes that they would accept you more because you, she felt, and I knew this and I'm like, you felt that if you told them, I don't like it, they would accept you. But if you told them you did like it, they might not like you. And we're not going to start sacrificing that right now. And just trying to teach her that, but also to live that out in my own life to where she sees me not just saying it, but being like, yeah, like I disagree with that, but I'm not going to just agree with you to your face to save face. Like, no, this is who I am. I don't agree with it. Um, and if you don't like me for that, then okay. It's nice knowing you, I guess. Not that I want to like just alienate myself, but I don't want to abandon myself more. And, uh, there's like a Dr. Seuss quote that's like, there's nobody youer than you, you know? And that's the truth. Like, you know, I'm doing this podcast and I know, um, I know there's a lot of other people who've done podcasts and I could easily be like, well, you know, they've already all done it, but nobody's done it the way I'm going to do it. And that's the truth. Like here I am. I have no idea what I'm doing, which I say every week, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm okay at video editing and I'm getting better at mixing the sound with these mics, with the video on the camera. Um, but I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never done a podcast. I've never put together a YouTube channel. You know, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm learning, I'm like learning as I go, which is the case with everything, building a wall, building a kitchen, you know, like I didn't know what I was doing when I started adding outlets to things. I, most of the stuff I do, I never know what I'm doing until I start doing it and researching as I go and just learning and doing it differently the next time. And I think that's what I'm trying to do with this whole thing. And one of the things we talked about on this retreat that we were on last week with the worship team was, you know, God is so kind in the fact that each one of us that are on the team have different backgrounds and different stories. And because of that, different types of songs speak to each of us differently. Like what worship looks like is different to me than it is to somebody else on the team. And I truly believe with everything in me that because of that, if we all have an opinion on the songs that we sing or we sing ones that resonate with us more, um, we're able to touch a part of someone that like, like if I'm singing a song that resonates with me and it speaks to my soul, that it's going to touch someone that has a similar story. But if someone else is singing a song that touches them, but it doesn't really impact me the same way, it's going to reach people that I couldn't have reached through the same, you know, through that song. Because if I sing it, it's not going to be as impactful because I don't feel it as much. And so I think it's the same thing. Like if I'm talking about a subject, it, it's going to reach people that another person won't reach. Um, I don't, <laughs> I don't even know if this is making any sense at this point. What, like something I want to know is like, what are, 
what are things that you struggle with? Like perfection. What is it that you try to be perfect in or you are never satisfied with your end product? What does that look like for you? Because I know I'm not the only one that struggles with this. I've talked to several people about the same topic. Like it's a very real thing. And a lot of it does come from comparison and um, we live in a world where we think we just have to have it all together. You got to look the part, you got to fake the part, you know, fake it till you make it. How many times I was told that in college, fake it till you make it. Like, I don't, I think I've given up on, (laughs) I think I've given up on that thought and that trying to fake it till I make it. Cause what's the point? You know, if you're not being true to yourself and honoring that, but you're faking it to help others be more comfortable. Are we making a difference? Is it worth hurting ourselves? Faking it so that other people aren't uncomfortable in our sadness or discontent or depression? You know, you ask someone like, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. And like you hear it in the way they say good. Like, no, you're not. That's a lie. And thankfully, like now in this season, I have friends who when I say that and I'm lying, they can totally read it on my face or my tone and they'll call me out on it. And um, they won't let me BS them. You know, they care about me more than they care about being comfortable. They're okay to sit in my messiness and my realness where there were times in my life where my being depressed was uncomfortable and new to the people that were in my life at the time. And this is something we've talked about, but like depression is so real and something I've struggled with off and on for a long time. Thankfully, like I have it pretty much under control. Um, I know how to take care of myself if I'm slipping into like anxiety or depression and Madi knows the signs and knows how to help me get out of that. And I'm very blessed that I married someone who cares enough about me to like help me get unstuck and not get stuck. Cause in college, I just, I got so stuck in the depression and it led to suicidal thoughts and suicidal, you know, suicidal attempts. And I think all of that stems back to trying to be something we're not so that others might like us. Um, That might have been when I was really struggling with knowing, figuring out that I was gay. And here I was surrounded by people in FCA and Fellowship of Christian Athletes here at my um, college. And like that wasn't allowed. You couldn't be gay. I mean, that was the last thing that was acceptable was being gay, even though like we were athletes and like majority of us Not majority, I don't want to say majority, but a good portion of athletes, especially female, were gay. Um, I know a lot of the students that we were counselors to at the camps that we worked at now are out of the closet and thriving. Um, And I don't know how much damage they've had because of things that were said in FCA or things that were said in church. Um about being gay. I know a lot of things were said that damaged me and I'm still working through and uh, God is healing and bringing me out of those, those lies and those traps and those closets of like, I'm not enough. I'm not, I'm not, uh, (laughs) I'm not Christian enough for the gays or I'm not, what is it? I'm too gay for the Christians and I'm too Christian for the gays like to not even think about that like just be me and let him do the rest Um, but I think uh I mean as someone who struggled with anxiety and depression like anxiety comes from living in the future and depression comes from living in the past and as cheesy as it sounds that's the way it's so important to like live in the now or the present there's no time like now Because, I mean, it's okay. Like, I'm a vision board person and a dreamer. And um, those things don't bring me anxiety. But when I start thinking about, okay, we're going to have a party over here, like Thanksgiving or whatever. And the kids, where are the kids going to be? Okay, so it's cold outside. So the kids are going to be downstairs. And 
what if one of the little kids falls up the stairs because it's cement down here and we don't have very good rails. Like I don't have whatever. And oh my gosh, what if they make a mess and this and then I stuff that's not even happened is going through my head as if it were real. And the truth is our brains don't know the difference between a thought and what's actually happening. So the hormones in our body start producing the same thing as if it were real, like anxiety comes up because my mind doesn't know that it's not actually happening. It just knows that I'm feeling it like a hundred percent. And so that kind of stuff causes me anxiety. Or if I think about, um, like say it's the end of the day and I've had a really crappy day and I was a terrible mom. You know, I lost my temper several times and I'm just like, Oh my God, what if, what if I ruin them? You know, what if I, why didn't I do that differently? Why didn't I do that this way? Why didn't I do that? And then, you know, I slowly slip into a depression. Those are very real things. And unless you've been through it or you're, you're close with someone who's been through it, you, it's really hard to handle. But at, since we're talking about depression and I'm blessed that I've gotten to go to counseling for this and I have been on antidepressants twice and off of them, I'm not on them anymore and haven't been for probably eight years, eight and a half years. I don't know. Not in my entire marriage. Um, praise God. Which if, if they're helping you, I'm all for it. I, my plan always when I got on antidepressants was it was a short term thing. A uh, year, I think, was the longest I was on them. But the hard part was like getting off of antidepressants. That was harder, I think, than when I got on them because of that chemical drop and that hormone drop. And thankfully, I've found a lot of ways that helped me rebalance out all my serotonin and, you know, everything that needs to fire in your brain and your body. But things that helped me besides counseling was I learned how to journal and write out those thoughts and um, the feelings that I was having in my head that would cause the depression, which would lead to the suicidal thoughts and the anxiety. I learned to write those down and write out everything. Like it was almost like it became like David would write in the Psalms, you know, like everything's terrible. Everyone's against me. Everything's going wrong. And then in all the Psalms, you know, David talks like that. And then he likes, but God, you are by me. You know, you are like, you uphold me with your right hand. You are my strong protector or whatever. And so I learned to write out like, oh my God, we're having a party and I'm so terrified this is going to happen. And I mean, this wasn't, I was, this was like before I got married. So it'd be like different things that I was worried about probably coming out. I don't know. Um, but I would write out all the crazy thoughts I was feeling because they were very real to me. And then I would practice on writing and because it was on paper, I could think about like, what is the truth about this situation? You know, what is really happening? And then I would write out things that I was thankful for because you can't stay in a place of depression or anxiety while also being in a state of gratitude. And so that was another thing I would do. Like if I couldn't even write out my feelings or whatever, I would just start writing out things I was thankful for. And then next thing I know, I have two pages of things that I'm super thankful for. And now um, being married to Madi and having kids I don't always have time to like just go and sit and write it in journal. I mean, every time I write and Apollo's around, he takes my pen and wants to color. So that's not like a thing I can do now. But um, now, you know, I started going through my depression when I was like 20, 21. So that was 12, 13 years ago. Um, now I just can talk about it either to myself or Madi and be like, look, this is what I know this isn't true, but my head thinks this is what's going to happen. And I know this is extreme, but this is where my brain's going. And this is a crazy re reality scenario that my brain is trying to tell me is going to happen. And I'm trying to talk about it so that I can get over it and realize that this is all not even real and most likely not going to happen. Um, but this is what I'm feeling. And I need you to just listen to me. And then I need you to remind me that I'm okay. And I'm reminding myself. That's why I'm talking about it. And I know sometimes it drives her crazy. But thankfully, she's learning that, like, these thoughts are very real to me. But I'm learning to cope with them even more quickly than I did back 12 years ago. Um, to where when we do have people over, 
I'm not so worried because I've dealt with these thoughts before. And if they come up during the party or whatever, I'm like, okay, that's not going to happen. That was your brain playing tricks on you and your past or whatever. The lies of the enemy because he knows your your weaknesses and your um, your fears, you know. And just reminding myself, like, everything's going to be great. It's going to be fun. And telling myself that even if I don't believe it at the time, like being like, look, it's going to be great. The kids are going to be fine. If someone gets hurt, we'll figure it out then. But don't go into this place where everything's going to fall apart and nothing has even started yet. I mean, I, I know depression and anxiety. They're still real to me. Thankfully, I'm past the suicidal thought thing. And that's just because I have a healthy relationship with my wife and uh, I've learned to talk to myself about talking myself off of a cliff basically um but that wasn't always the case you know like I said in college I had friends who had never been around anyone who were depressed and I was super depressed in college I mean I did I tried to park my car on train tracks and like just screamed no like I knew it was the devil just tempting me and it was just in this scary place and I didn't know how to deal with myself, so how could I expect my friends who had never dealt with depression either to know how to deal with me? Um, that was none of our faults. We were young. We were children. Um, so if you are going through depression, I mean, this started out talking about perfection, and I think perfection also, like dr striving to be perfect, also can lead us to depression because we're never going to be perfect. I mean, it's never going to be perfect. It, we just have to do our best. And so if you're going through depression, one, I'm sorry. I know it's hard. Um, two, I would love to hear your story and encourage you in any way I can. So message me or comment on the video or the podcast, whatever. Um, I know depression's a scary thing to be open about. Um, Something that helped me, a couple things that helped me, and I can link those, uh, that helped me when I, after I had Apollo, I got postpartum anxiety at like seven months after I had him. And it, I had never had anxiety before. I'd had depression, and but anxiety was like a whole new thing. It was like panic attacks on steroids, and I just thought I was going to die. Just, I couldn't even function. Um, but a couple of things that helped me, Monty did a lot of research. One thing was I got on better prenatal vitamins because I was nursing Apollo. So he was taking all of my vitamins that came from my food, which how many, how much are we getting from our food these days? Um, so if you're not nursing or whatever, just get on some really good quality vitamins, not cheap, like good quality vitamins to make sure you're not deficient in anything. Um, another thing I, I used was, it was called Angiogalm. We went to like a natural health store here. I'll link that because it is available on Amazon. Angiocalm, which has a bunch of different minerals and vitamins in it, and it helps balance out your hormones and everything for anxiety. And then I did research because I'm really big into essential oils. And so I have a book um, that would it tells me all about different oils and what they're good for and what they help with. And patchouli, which is very earthy and woodsy. It's a tree, um, and my dad's a carpenter. And so it smells like my dad to me. Um, patchouli actually helps with anxiety. And so I ordered that oil, which I can also link. Um, and all of those things together um, really helped quickly. Like in a couple, I want to say within two weeks, if not less, helped me just start functioning again like normal. And so I've also, I mean... As far as the oils, I've also helped um, some people in my family have struggled with anxiety attacks, like bad ones, consistently. And so it's been nice to, like, have this little secret weapon in my pocket where I can make them a little roller and it has, like, patchouli and orange oil, um, which orange oil is supposed to help bring you joy and put you in a state of happiness. And so I, I add that with the patchouli because... It's all about like lifting your mood and getting you out of this anxiety, which like I said, anxiety is usually living in the future and the future looks scary. And so then you have a panic attack, like, oh my God, everything's going to fall apart and it hasn't even happened yet. So it's very real in your brain that all, all this stuff is falling apart. So, um, 
I make a roller for them. It's like patchouli, orange oil, and then a couple other high frequency oils is what they are that I've just researched that they really help me. And I mean, even Maddie, when all the pandemic started and they got all these rules at her work, um, you know, like, I mean, she, her career is an essential career. She's never been home when everyone got sent home to work from home. Like she has not had that at all. So she was like there, you know, and nobody knew what was going on and they had to switch. And she had like majority of the people in her store were her team because she couldn't have a lot of people. And all of it caused a lot of anxiety because she had to learn a new way to do her job and help people when everything felt weird. And so she was having anxiety a little bit and that roller helped her like stay calm in this stressful situation of learning a new way to do her job, um, and help people when it just felt weird. Uh, so those are some things that have helped me besides writing. Um, I think it's very important to take vitamins and stuff that, um, can just help your body function better with my depression. When I got off of my, um, I, this seat, and this is what I'm talking about. I did not know exactly what I was going to talk about when I started this. I just felt like I was supposed to start talking. And here we are talking about anxiety and depression, which is a really big thing in my life that I've struggled with and worked through and learned about. Um, so when I struggled with depression, right after Maddie and I got married, it had been about a year since I got off the antidepressants the second and final time. And what happens after you get off antidepressants is all of the sudden out of nowhere. Mine was about a year the second time you just have this huge drop and it's like you're back in that depression, which happened the first time, but I didn't know enough and I didn't know enough people that I got on antidepressants the second time because that drop happened and I didn't know what to do when the people I was around saw it happen and they didn't know any natural ways, so they suggested me getting on antidepressants. So the second time it happened, I knew I didn't want to get on them again because... I mean, both times I got off. The second time I got off antidepressants, I almost killed myself twice, which I talked about kind of a little bit to my mom in her episode. So anyways, when I got off of them, I was married to Maddie, and I had a friend that worked at a health store here, and I just went and told her what was happening. You know, I was newly married. Um, I was experiencing these huge depressive thoughts and knew, I mean, I know my pattern enough by now that, like, I knew if I didn't do something, it wasn't going to be okay. So she suggested me get on taurine, which the first thought I had was that's in, that's in the monster drinks, you know, because I grew up drinking monsters in college, coffee and monsters and McDonald's was my diet, Um, but monsters have taurine in them. And so I took these pills, they were taurine. And then I think it was called 5-HTP. And what these two things did was helped everything in my brain start firing again like it helped boost it to where it would function on its own because what had happened was all those antidepressants had finally left my system and then I just felt that drop and so my body needed a way to like remind itself to get those levels back up and so this was a natural way that I don't even take them anymore but those pills which were natural also helped me um start functioning again and feeling better and sleeping better and, you know, everything, all the things. Um, so, I mean, like I said, I can link those too. I'm pretty sure I've bought those on Amazon before, but, uh, yeah, there's so many natural ways to like help ourselves through things that aren't talked about enough. Um, probably because they don't make people a lot of money. Uh, they're cheaper. Um, But I know depression and anxiety are a very real thing, especially like I can't imagine. This is something I talk to Monty about all the time. I'm like, man, everyone is so stressed about this virus, but like so many people also experience depression and anxiety for the first time in their lives this past year. And that is more scary to me than anything because I've been in the depths of depression. Um, And that's a scary, scary place. So I know it's very real this year. Um, I saw Monty start to go through it at the beginning of the pandemic. And we had tried to do quarantine for two months, which she has a huge family. And so her not seeing her family for, it might have been a month. But um, I don't know. After a couple months, I was like, honey, I'm the depressed one. Like, you can't be depressed. I can't. I can't handle you depressed. You have to be 
you, which is joy and happy and let's go do this next thing. And so for us, for, and I don't, I mean, if you disgrace, sorry, that's fine. Uh, like I said, be true to myself for us we stopped quarantining as much. Like we had to be around her family. She needed to see her sisters. She needed to see her mom. She needed to see her grandma, who is like her world. Uh, She's amazing. But it was more the risk of possibly getting sick um, was safer to me than the risk of staying in quarantine and watching my life, my wife slowly become depressed. Cause I was not a lot of about to let her go down that road. Um, our kids deserved better. And so, uh, I mean, with depression and anxiety, uh, another thing I could suggest is like, what are you watching? Who are you watching on social media? You know, what shows, Are these shows causing you stress? Are they causing you fear? Are they causing you like bad negative emotions? Um, Stop watching them. The people you're following, are they making you feel less than, like you're not enough? Stop following them. Um, When we were trying to get pregnant, it took a year almost. I think it was like nine months, 10 months. I don't remember exactly. 13 tries. Um, And so during that time, Like we stopped watching Empire or um, there was another show we stopped watching because they just made me feel so sad. I started having anxiety during the shows because they were so mean to each other and they were so aggressive with each other and hateful. And I was like, this isn't bringing me good energy. And I'm all about energy and emotions. And um, I knew that if I wasn't in a high vibrational feeling myself because of the crap I was watching and consuming the chances of me getting pregnant were going to be even lower. It's just like if you have cancer, you'd like watch happy things because negative emotions can't function at the same time as positive. So um, look at what you're watching. Look at what you're consuming, what you're allowing in your home, especially that's like super important. If someone comes over and their energy is like crap, you know, cleanse your home, pray over that home as soon as they leave and maybe don't invite them back over, you know, um, just be aware of, of what you're consuming, who you're spending your time with and how it's making you feel. Because when, when you're going through that, like your health is so important. And if you're not okay and you're like a mom or a dad or whatever in charge of a team, you can't give anything. You can't give anything from an empty cup. So just be aware of the energy and the the stuff you're consuming. Yeah. (laughs) This is not where I expected to go, but I'm really glad we did because it's such an important thing to me. Um, and I know it's real. I just, I know it's so real. And just because you're something I said, um, to my mom the other day, I was like, just because your depression might not look as bad as someone else's doesn't make it less important. Um, just because your pain, you think it might not be as bad as someone else's like, oh, well, they are, you know, they tried to commit suicide. I'm not there yet. It doesn't matter. Stop it as soon as you can. Stop your depression before it gets to that suicidal thought. Stop your anxiety before it gets to you're on the floor or you feel like you just have to drink to function. I've been there. It's terrifying. Um, your health is just as important as anybody else's. To me, mine is so important because if I'm not functioning well, like I can't take care of my family. I can't be my best for them. Um, Thankfully, I married someone who when my health isn't doing well, she is right there to like pick up the slack and help me feel better. She knows me. And that's been an important part of our marriage is just being open about my depression and, and the past and my depression in the present and you know, there's none right now, thank God. Um, but when it does come up, she notices and I am have full permission to talk about it without judgment. And I think that's important. If you're with someone who negates your mental health, I don't know that you should stay with them, especially if they're not willing to change because it's a very real thing and it's a very scary thing. Um, we're never going to be perfect. <laughs> But that thing, that mental health can become better. And I'm living proof of that. Like you can learn to function and 
deal with it like quickly and just on the go way fast I, I deal with it way faster than I used to I don't I don't know that I have anything else to talk about but I would love to hear your stories of not that I want to hear depressing stories or anxiety but like I would love to hear your stories if you're going through it if you've been through it how you've coped with it things that have helped you I would love to know um and if you you know need advice like I, I do my best to respond to everything in a timely manner and I appreciate y'all's feedback so much. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for going on this journey with me as I grow into whatever this is supposed to be. Please leave reviews on Apple Podcasts and YouTube, especially. Uh, I appreciate them so much. Um, and I couldn't do this without y'all. If you know someone who would benefit from this episode, um, who's dealing with depression or anxiety or just trying to be perfect and comparing themselves to everyone, um, please share it with them. Cause I couldn't do this without y'all. Like I can only share and use so many hashtags that, it's, you know, it's through you that this is going to get into all the right hands for people who need it. Um, I'm just trying to be obedient and following the call that I feel on my heart to do this. So thank you so much for listening. And until me, bleh, until next week, have a great one. Bye. Hey guys, thanks for listening to my mom's podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications, and give this video a big thumbs up. Also, thanks for your comments and your feedback. Hey guys, thanks. (laughs) Hey guys, thanks for listening to my podcast. Oh gosh. <laughs>